So I think about weird stuff sometimes. Y'all wouldn't know that. But, you know, have you ever wondered, have you ever wondered, and I'm sure many of you had, I'm sure I'm not weird, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, what it's like to be a baby in the womb, like right at nine months. You know what I mean? I want you to think about this with me for a minute. You've spent almost a year, and, and I'm going to make sure, Kate, I'm going to be looking at you for the first part of this, okay? So, so stay with me. Amniotic fluid, right? That's right. You know, you know, whenever you go on, you know, okay, so I've got a, a lot of kids, and we've also got a lot of cousins, so in the summertime we go swimming, and it's like 18 kids around, and it's wild, and no matter where you go, it's wild, but you know the one place that you can go that like shuts it all out, like after they're climbing on you, like they're climbing on you, you know where you can go? You go under the water, right? And it's like this peaceful, <laughs> okay, this, that's what I'm talking about. So for nine months, you're in this like underwater, warm, you know, dynamic growth, dynamic growth, probably a little bit of growing pains in there, kicking and stuff, but for the most part, it's like safe, warm, protected, you know, like even if mom is fighting with dad a little bit, you know, all you hear is like, whoa, whoa, and you're like, oh, that sounds great, you know, but then there's this thing that happens where that little place you're living in, it starts to, you know, some of you have given birth. I personally haven't. But that womb, it starts to go like, mm, 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 you know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about? From the outside, I, all I'm seeing is nothing's changed. And my wife is like, ah, ah, you know what I'm saying? But the, what the womb is like, you know, the womb is talking to the baby. I don't know if you've heard that interaction. This may not be in the books, but this is what's going on. The womb is talking to the baby, and the womb is saying, it's time to go. And it's like, woo, woo, and then it'll let off from it, and the baby's I'm like, okay, that's cool. That probably only needs to happen once. And then it happens again, right? I don't know that, you know, it depends on how far along you are, and then it gets, starts to get closer together. But all of it is the womb is communicating to the baby. It is time to go. It's time to get out. Like, we're going to put some pressure on you, little baby, like, to get you out. And then, you know, I'm sure the baby is looking at the womb saying, yeah, yeah, but where, how, how do we get out of here? And the womb is talking to the baby and saying, that's the way out right there. And the baby is looking at the whole thinking, that's not a way out, man. Like, that's not a way out. I don't know what you're thinking, womb, but you can put all the pressure on you want. I'm not going out there. Do you know what I'm saying? That's, that's, yeah, it's beautiful. But then eventually, you know what happens? The womb wins, you know? And that baby goes. So there's this, uh, there's this Hebrew term. And that Hebrew term is Mitzrayim. And it's actually the Hebrew word. Actually, it's actually the Hebrew word for Egypt. Um, when the Hebrew people celebrate Passover, they celebrate this leaving of the safety, well, it didn't get safe. It was safe for a very long time of Egypt where they grew from a small nation into this larger people. And then it got very, very, very difficult really, really, really fast. And they were forced out. And that word Mitzrayim, which means Egypt, it actually comes from the Hebrew phrase that means narrow way. And so when Jesus says that phrase that you've probably heard before, um, when he says, um, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, that is precisely what is being talked about. Mitzrayim really comes from the word for birth canal. So when, when Israel understood how they went from a slave nation and then through those ten plagues, the womb contracting. And if you really read the story well, what you'll see in there is that the Hebrews actually did not really want to leave. They were forced out of Egypt. They were actually would have been content being slaves and, and being fed as opposed to being forced out into the wilderness. That's why they always, in the wilderness, want to go back. Um, it was really them crying out, not knowing what it was going to take to get them out, and then Moses kind of pushed them along, and then 
the, the chariots pushing them out finally. But that's the idea, right? Is the Mitzrayim, it's the, it's the narrow way, it's the hard way, it's that, that, that way that doesn't seem like a way. Like that's not really a way, womb. That's not the way. When Jesus says that phrase, that the gate is narrow and the way is hard, he's not saying, I think the way we can interpret it, he's not saying that there's only a few people that find Jesus and finding Jesus is hard and he's the gate. He's not making himself the gate in that particular text. He does in other texts. But in that particular text, he's drawing on the Hebrew tradition of the Mitzrayim, of that the way to life, the way to finding life, is actually this very narrow, difficult way. And that there are plenty of other ways, but those ways lead to death, and there are many that find them. But the way that leads to life is narrow, and the way's hard. Um, and so I, what, I, what I want you to follow me here with for a little bit today is that that life with God, like real life with God, where God is a reality, where God is a reality in your life. And when I, when I say he's a reality in your life, what I mean is that he's not a concept and he's not a story and he's not, he doesn't just exist, but he like, he's a part of what goes on in your life. Do you know what I'm saying? He's a reality there. He affects you and, and you affect him. That, that real life only comes on the other side of the narrow way that we as those who follow Jesus are brought into on many, many, many occasions in our life. Sometimes big and sometimes very, very small. Um, I'm, let me just kind of preview where we're, where we're going. Um, we are at a place in Acts, and specifically Acts 9.31 is a verse that is... It's, it's the very last text for today, but Acts 9.31 is that moment after a mother gives birth and all that screaming and all that pain and all that crying and all that, all that's done. And it's almost forgotten about. And the mom is holding the, it's the picture time. Do you know what I mean? Where the baby's wrapped. We got all that stuff off. I love to get a picture before that stuff comes off, right as the baby starts crying. Like, the crazy baby face when the baby comes out into the real world. I, I have a picture of face to face picture of all of my kids. It's disgusting. But there's a time right after that where it's cleaned up, wrapped up. That's what Acts 9.31 is. And let me read Acts 9.31 for you real quick. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up. And they were walking in the fear of the Lord. So whenever I say that, that, that walking in the fear of the Lord, that's the, same, that's the biblical way of talking about God as a reality. Okay, There are people that believe that God exists, but there are those who fear the Lord. And it doesn't mean that they're like so scared of him. It's just that his bigness and his reality affects them. And so they, so they walk as if he's real. Like They make choices as if he's real. They make choices as if he's there. They sing worship as if he's present. They pray as if he hears. They, they, they talk to him through their decisions as if their decisions actually affect what he has for them. Do you feel me on that? Like, he is a reality. He's not just somebody that we prove exists. He's a person that affects humanity, affects the world, and affects our lives. And like I said, we affect also by our prayers and our interactions and our relationship to him. Uh, and they were walking in the fear of the Lord, and they were walking in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. The church multiplied. That's Acts 9.31. Um, and it is this really huge concluding text because if you've been following us for a while, what you can kind of see from about Acts 1.5 to where we are now is there was this moment in Acts 1.5 where the Spirit of God descends um, and the church is conceived is the best way to say that. But there is this period there in Jerusalem where the church is having dynamic growth punctuated by these moments of discomfort. It's growth, and the church is only in Jerusalem. There's only Christians in Jerusalem at this time, okay? It's only there in this one little town. 
And what God's desire is that these people would scatter all over the earth and they would be the leaven that leavens the earth, right? But how do you get these people out of Jerusalem? Because they got a good thing going and it's really nice. Well, then what we saw in Acts 7, so it's growing, 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 a little discomfort, but then it's growing, growing, growing. And then in Acts 7, there's something very dramatic happens. Do you remember what that is? There's a guy named Saul who shows up on the scene and he's done with it. And it goes from being a little bit of discomfort to a guy named Saul going into Christians' houses, dragging them out of their houses the way that the Bible says, dragging them out and imprisoning them. And so there is this enormous ramp up in the amount of pressure that is put on that Jerusalem Christian community. Let's conceive of that as those first contractions, right? And now you've got people being imprisoned. You've got a guy, Stephen, being killed at the feet of this guy named Saul. And then Saul is traveling around to other places where Christianity might have spread, and he's trying to put a stop to it. So you're seeing this thing where it's contraction time. It's not just discomfort. This is a different story. This is like major pain, pressure, and difficulty. And that's what we've been reading for the last few weeks is that there's this enormous amount of pressure put on the church, on the people who follow Jesus. And there's a thing that happens when there's an enormous amount of pressure put on a human being who follows Jesus. They start to wonder if God really is a reality. If all of those things are true or if it's made up or if this is a fake thing or if this is a real thing. Well then, there's this really key turning point that happened last week. That guy Saul is blinded on his way to Damascus and Jesus himself steps in and doesn't say, why are you harming my church? But he says, why are you harming me? Saul breaks, remains blind, and then stops eating and drinking for three days until a man named Ananias comes to him because he was told to directly by Jesus to go lay his hands on him and pray for him to receive the Holy Spirit and to regain his sight. And Ananias is freaked out because that fool has been killing folk. And you're cool, Jesus, but I'm not really trying to die today. And Jesus assures Ananias that he has a different plan for Saul. So what you get right at the end of the text that we're going to look at today is these final moments of contractions that are the birth of the church into the world is the best way to say that. And I wanted to highlight that text before we jump in because I want you to see something interesting that happens about Saul as he goes from being a man who starts those contractions to being a man who is immediately experiencing those contractions and experiencing that pressure. And he goes on the other side of the war that he pretty much started. And so I want to look at him for a minute and then I kind of want to do this in a fun way. And Katie, here we got to go again. The baby on the way out. <laughs> there are four cardinal movements, right? Right? There are four movements that that baby has to make to get out the narrow way. Now, I don't know, but it, okay, maybe you can help me out. <laughs> no, not going to do that? Okay. But to make it through, there's something along the line. It's not, it's, not, it's not a path that's just straight. The baby has to do a few things, like put its head down. Then it has to turn. Then it has to put its head up at just the right time. And then the doctor, that you pay a lot of money, who shows up right at the end. He comes in and he grabs that baby by the head. Works it out. But there's four cardinal movements. And I just thought that would be a fun way for us to look at these four things Fun is right, huh? Yeah. Yeah, memorable. That's it, memorable. The four cardinal ways of us walking through the narrow way. Because like I said, 
There are big ways, there are small ways, but the life of a Christian in the way that Jesus framed it is that if you want to find life, there are times in your life when you have to walk the narrow way. Let me establish this one step further. So when you're in college and you start to get a different idea about what your major is than what your parents think your major ought to be, none of y'all been through that, right? Nobody. And then, and then you have to begin to establish that it's your future and not your parents' future, but a lot of times they're paying for it. And there is this, there's this birth that happens a lot of times right as you're getting near the end of the college career when you are growing into an adult and your decisions actually affect your future and you're trying to make the best decisions you possibly can and your parents are still footing the bill for a lot of things, supporting you in a lot of ways, they're trying to get you from that step where they're supporting you to that step where they're not supporting you anymore and it has a lot to do with you getting a job that pays, not just like a job that's fun. And so there's this, there's this tension on both parties about what to do in a situation like that. And a lot of times, especially working with a lot of college students, it's easy for both parties, the parent or the kid, to blow up, to make extreme measures, and there is a, there's a lot of friction that doesn't need to be had because inside of that process, there is a narrow way for both an adult to walk and a student to walk that honors the parents, but also honors what the student is becoming at this step in their life. You follow me? In it, there's a narrow way. There's like, there's like one way to do that right. And there's a million ways to do that wrong. And it never looks like that one way is actually a way it seems impossible. You follow me? I'm just giving an example. Theoretical. Nobody here has experienced them. Or, and then, okay, that's a big way, but just think a small way. Just think of every conflict with your spouse. Just think of every single one of those. Where you have like a legitimate issue, or they have a legitimate issue, but that legitimate issue doesn't get voiced in like the most perfect way. And since it's not voiced in the most perfect way, it like grinds on you in a really major way. And so now that conversation went from this issue we need to discuss to the way that you're talking to me that I always feel disrespected by you and I'm sleeping on the couch. Yeah, you are sleeping. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Again, theoretical and none of you have had that experience. But if you'll walk with me theoretically, you'll see that in a situation like that where two people value things and they don't see eye to eye, the conversation dissolves the thing that's important doesn't get really addressed and two people are left actually further away from where they need to be than when they started. But the reality is, is there is a really, really, really narrow way that you navigate conversations like that so that you hear things that are hard to hear and you don't get all prickly and you stay calm. And you walk through it. And you come out on the other side actually closer. Actually more unified. Actually in a better relationship. What Jesus might call life in a relationship. But it only happens through the narrow way. Or when you're starting to get a budget down. We're really establishing this. You know? And you feel the constraint of not having quite enough money to do the things that you would like to do, but just enough money to do the things you need to do and have to do. And then it can become kind of a frustrating dance, not just between, let's say, you and a spouse, but you and a spouse and a boss. And then your spouse starts to view your boss in a certain way, but you kind of like your boss. You don't like him all the time, but you like him most of the time. And the spouse is mad at the boss because the boss isn't shelling out the cash. And you've got growing needs. And there's a way, there's a way 
that's narrow. There's a way that has constraint in understanding the role of the budget, good communication, to get through there, make it to the other side where there actually is life and actually maybe more resources. But it usually is not an easy, obvious path. It's usually a pretty narrow way. Y'all are with me, right? So now as we read this text, I want us to draw from it a couple things. Going to fly through it. We'll have a lot of fun. Memorable is the word, Paul. Let's jump in. Acts 9, 19 to 31. This is in reference to Saul. For some days, Saul was with the disciples at Damascus. And immediately, he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And, and really, he's just, he's, th- that makes everybody in a synagogue mad because they're Jewish and they don't believe Jesus was the Messiah or the Son of God, and that's why he was crucified. And all who heard him were amazed, and they said, Is not this man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring these Christians bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength, and he confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him. But his disciples took him by night, led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. And they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the... uh, Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem preaching boldly in the name of the Lord and he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists but they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this they brought him down to Caesarea and they sent him off to Tarsus and then here we get the close of this very large section of Acts. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. The church multiplied. So here's the first thing that I want us to grab. Let's look at the first cardinal, the first cardinal movement of the narrow way. Stop being surprised. What do I mean by that? The first thing we need to recognize about Saul here is that he is immediately after following Jesus, after submitting to the Lord of all the earth, after crowning Jesus king and submitting himself to the one who made everybody and who rules all things, what's the first thing that begins to happen to Saul? People want to kill him. They want to kill him. Do you know the way that me and you oftentimes conceive of following Jesus, like an infomercial. You know how infomercials are black and white at the beginning and then they shift to color? When, you know what I mean? Like if it's about, I don't know, what's the last infomercial? I can't even think of a good one right now. Uh, like a detergent or something, right? Like it's a detergent, okay? It's, right, what is it? Flex Seal. Hold on, there's gonna be a minute. To Let's just go with detergent, okay? <laughs> Okay, in it, okay what, what'll happen is you got a black and white scene of a woman like, the dishes are falling apart, oh my gosh, and it's black and white, and then she's like writing divorce papers at the end, and then it shifts to color, and here comes the product, and now the dishes like magically clean themselves, and there's sparkle in the air, and they're going on a cruise. Do you know what I'm saying? Like... But keep in mind, it's not just infomercials. Most commercials are that way. They just don't do the black and white thing. But it's like, you have a major problem. And it's killing you. And it's over-dramatized. Here's a product. Take the product. Your life is awesome. You're rich and beautiful. Do you know what I'm saying? We can oftentimes talk about following Jesus. And we've been programmed with that narrative so much. That we don't. We get surprised when we submit to Jesus, when we walk in his way, when we eagerly try to do the things that we believe he's called us to do, when we start tithing even when it's tight. 
when we start trying to get up early and read scriptures, like we start trying to do it the right way. We like, we like step into the narrow way. You know what I'm talking about? And you jump into it. And then you're like, you're like knocked back. And we're like, God, you run everything. You made everything. You're the most powerful person. You're sovereign. What are you doing to me? And then all of the confidence that we went into the narrow way is lost because we got into the narrow way and we're constrained by it and it was difficult in there and there's persecution in there and it doesn't go the way we thought and we are blown back and surprised. And then what happens is we go that whole weird route where we start blaming God and getting frustrated with the people around us and then we jump out of the narrow way and we, st- we stop walking it in the way of Jesus so we, we go one of two ways. We get mad and blame God that it's difficult, and I thought you were the guy that was going to fix it. I thought you were gonna, the guy that was going to make it from black and white to color. Like, you own everything. You do everything. You're the most powerful. Like, what's going on? And then we're kind of done with him, and we stop drawing near to him. We stop finding strength in him. And we stop seeking his guidance, and we stop being in relationship to him, and we just kind of, like, puff up and push back. Or there's typically people associated with the narrow way that we're walking in, and we start doing that stuff to them, too. Because we're surprised that it was difficult. So cardinal movement one, stop being surprised. If you guys really, really do submit yourself to Jesus in the middle of conflicts with your spouse, in the middle of conflicts with your parents, in the middle of trying to figure out how to manage money, in the middle of life, in the middle of having jobs, in the middle of being employed, in the middle of being an employer, in the middle of all these things that are our life, raising kids, like disciplining kids. My kids, I've disciplined them perfectly and they still don't do the right thing. You know what I'm saying? There's still a narrow way there. It's not God's fault. It's not my fault. Most of their fault. But there is a way to discipline kids well that actually produces life, and there are a thousand wrong ways to do it. You follow me? The reality is, is don't go into difficult conversations with your spouse and be surprised when there's pressure. Don't go into difficult conversations with your parents and think it's going to be super easy. Go in ready to walk the narrow way with them, honoring them. Don't be surprised when your kids act wild. They are wild hellions like they are. We got to have a plan. We got to have a narrow way that we walk and we don't get surprised when it gets tight and it gets pressure and it gets difficult. So what we see in the life of Paul is that he goes into that narrow way. And what we find out is he's there for three years. Very quickly they want to set a plot to kill him. He stays in it and then what we see, he leaves Damascus and he goes to Jerusalem. And what do they want to do in Jerusalem when he's in Jerusalem? They want to kill him again. What we don't see from Saul is him turning his back on God or blowing up everybody around him. He continues to stay and walk in that narrow way. Okay, cardinal movement two. Hear his voice and then hang on. Let me tell you something that I've seen in my own relationship with the Lord. And I can show it to you in a text but I want you to see something that I've seen in my own relationship with the Lord. A lot of times when it gets really, really difficult and the pressure is really, really on, that's when we start saying, God, what do you want me to do? 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 Am I doing something wrong? Am I doing something wrong? So we go from surprise to, God, now what do I do? I must be doing something wrong because there's pressure here and I must be doing something wrong. So what do I need to do? What do I need to do? Most of the time in my experience, God communicated to me prior to the pressure even starting. And the pressure is making me think that I'm doing something wrong when in fact he spoke to me so that I could make it through the time of pressure. So one, I say all that to say, if you don't have a dynamic relationship with the Lord where you're learning to sense his voice and hear from him in the day in and day out, you can't make it through the pressure, bottom line. So if you can go to your Bible and understand what the text means, that's good. If you can go to your Bible and interact with the one who wrote it, then you can make it through those pressure times. Understanding the Bible doesn't give you any power. 
hearing God's voice in the text and hearing God's voice by his spirit who is becoming one with you is how you navigate the times of pressure. The example from the text, so you don't think that I'm making this up. When Jesus is baptized, he is baptized, he comes out of the water. What is the word that is spoken over him? This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He immediately is sent by the Spirit. It's the next text. Immediately sent by the Spirit into where? The wilderness. The place of pressure, the place of testing, the place of trial, the place of difficulty. He fasts for 40 days. What is the first temptation that he receives? Turn, okay, what's the first temptation that he receives? If you are what? The son of God, then turn these to stone. Do you see that what's being attacked in Jesus is not his ability to turn rocks into bread, but his ability to hear his father's voice and hang on to it when it's difficult? Because what his response to the snake is, I am not hungry. It's not what he says. He says, I don't live on bread. I live from what? Every word that comes from the mouth of God. So we have to recognize that Jesus faced the trials and the temptations strengthened by his verbal relationship with God. Sensing the voice of God, hearing the voice of God, and hanging on to it when it's difficult. If Jesus needed it, hate to break it to you, you're going to need it too. Learning to sense and walk in the direction and the leading and the voice of God takes time, it takes humility, it takes frustration, it just takes the willingness to stay with it. Because we are Westerners who have not been raised in a culture that trained us how to interact with a spirit who is becoming one with your own heart. Even as I say that, y'all, some of y'all are like, that's super weird. And I'm sorry, it's just the Bible. And I remember what I said in the opening. We all believe some weird stuff here. Okay? That God became a man. That he died on a cross. That he's going to resurrect the entire human race. And that he died on a cross so that he could place his spirit within you. It's just it's basic, Right? But that spirit's in you for a reason, for a reason, for a reason. To give you the ability to walk the narrow way. Because on the other side of the narrow way is life. All right, let's jump into Cardinal Movement 3. This is super simple, right? I try to get all snappy with it. But I can't get snappy with it. Talk less, pray more. Here's what I mean, though. Here's precisely what I mean. Your relationship with God is not just hearing from Him. Your relationship with God is moving Him by an interaction with Him. Let me give you an example. Me and my... Okay, look. If I talk about my wife up here, I want you all to know me and her are both on the same page that our life as a part of this church is to stand on a stage, not because we're better, because we want you to understand what it's like when we walk with the Lord because we think you're going to face similar things. But again, I'm not going to say anything bad about my wife, but every time I bring her up, it's like, does she know what's going on? Yes. Me and my wife are together on this. But me and my wife had kind of a, a running conflict. And I did a poor job of handling it, and this is how it went. She would come home, and she would want to vent, about something that her friend was doing to her. And as she would explain what her friend was doing to her, and this happened quite a bit, the same thing. As she would explain what her friend was doing to her, you know what's going on in my mind? You do that same thing to me. (laughs) And it is maybe the thing that bothers me the most about our relationship. And you're very upset about it happening to you. And I'm also upset about it happening to me. (laughs) But this started as a moment for you to get things off of your chest. And now I can't handle hearing you talk about it anymore. Is this, again, theory? But what it would result in 
is not me hearing my wife and not me consoling her. It typically resulted in a pretty big blow up because I would try to direct her because I didn't want that stuff happening to me anymore because it was really, really hurting me at a deep level, frustrating me at a deep level. And she was appalled that it was happening to her, but I wasn't allowed to be appalled that it was happening to me. And she said to me, I just need you to hear me. And I felt the Lord put in front of me a narrow way. And you know what that narrow way was? Listen to her. And shut up. And so I did. She would tell me, and, and it was, it was it, it, the stuff that was happening was hard enough on her that it would bring her to tears. And it wasn't a small thing. It was a hard enough thing. And so I submitted myself that I'm not going to say a word except for I love you and I'm sorry and I would hold her. It was the fakest hold <laughs> that you can possibly imagine. I'm like this. But I committed to the narrow way. And I'm like this, shaking And you know what's going through my mind? If you don't confront her, this will never change. You're weak. You're laying down underneath it. You're not leading her. A bunch of garbage. Half of it was like wrapped up in Bible verses too. You know, like that Ephesians stuff about wives submitting to their husbands, you know? Demons are good. They'll wrap up, they'll wrap a Bible verse around the arrow and then they'll just like, and we're like, sweet Bible, yeah, great. But I, but, but I had really felt as if the Lord had given direction and my job was to stay in the narrow way. Like I, that was, that, I, I, I didn't have anything else. I could, I could rationalize as much as I want, but my job for my father, hold her, I'm sorry, and I love you. There were, there were many occasions she would go to sleep and you know what I would do? I would go into our closet. I would put my face on the ground and cry. Because I was so mad. I would cry at God out of anger. Because I could not see anything changing. I could not understand why I was supposed to do this. And I would basically just moan. Sometimes it was a manly moan. And sometimes it was a less than manly moan. But I never confronted her about it. Because I didn't feel like it was that, that was what needed to happen in that instance. It doesn't mean that there's no confrontation in my house. It meant in that instance, it was not what needed to be done. And she came to me, I don't know, a month later, and literally word for word says, I think I've been doing this to you, and I'm extremely sorry. And I don't want to be that way to you anymore. And I love you. And I, I wept in front of her. I wept in front of her. It was a moment in our marriage where I began to trust that my wife has a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Yeah? There is a good chance the person that you're married to has a relationship with the Holy Spirit. And it is better for you to talk to God about your spouse than it is to talk to your spouse about God. You will get more out of that. And it will be terribly painful. That's not just true for spouses. It might be true for kids. It might be true for parents. It might be true for friends. It might be true for bosses. It might be true for everyone that you're around. Well, not everybody you're around, but it might be true for many people you're around. Okay, cardinal movement four. Sorry, yes, cardinal movement four. This one I got a little snappy with. Is that good? Alliteration, right? Praise while the pressure is on. It's not until the very end of this story that any of it makes sense to the people in the story. When the church is growing and then a powerful man in the synagogue is actually given authority to kill Christians and to imprison Christians, 
it is very easy for those Christians to be like, what the heck is going on, God? What are you doing? I thought you had power. I thought you were moving. I don't see what you're up to. I don't see why you allowed this. I can't understand why you would allow, like, I don't get this. Until this moment, in this particular text, where Saul is not just converted to, to Christianity and then goes to hide away, but he's converted to Christianity and then he takes up the cause of Christ against powerfully the people that he was formerly with. Do you see how powerful of a movement on God's part that whole narrative is? To allow Saul to go down the road of starting the persecution, of getting it ramped up, of getting it ramped up, and then while it's in mid-progress, like while it's going on, for him to come to Saul and meet, because he could have talked to him, you know, like a month ago. If you're going to go knocking people off horses and blinding them, why didn't you knock them off the horse and blind him before he started taking people to jail? God, I got a great idea for you. The goodness of God and the sovereignty of God and the power of God is witnessed in the way that this story unfolds. So that the people who are being drug out of their homes, the people that thought the darkness was stronger than the light, now get to look in the face of the man who was doing it. They get to look in his face and he gets to convey to them that he is going to fight on their behalf. That he's going to go to war against the establishment that was pulling them out of their homes. The one who understands the Old Testament like none of them did, the one that can paint this story every time he goes into a synagogue about how Jesus is actually Messiah, how Jesus is actually the king of the world, and how everything in the Old Testament has been pointing to it the entire time, and he is confounding people is what it says. They don't know what to say to this guy. And so these Christians, it's not just that they were protected. It's that they saw the powerful movement of God in reversing their fate. But you know what happened when all that pressure was put on the Jerusalem church? Do you know what happened because of that? The Jerusalem church split up and went all over the world. The sovereignty of God and the goodness of God And the way that he unfolded this was only real in the very end. When Saul is now about to get killed in Jerusalem because he's so good at what he does that they have to send him away to his hometown for a little bit to let it die down. And then it says those words, the church had peace. But the church didn't just have peace because they were cloistered in a room. The church had peace because they saw the reality of God. He was, a, he was, he was real in their lives because they saw him move on their behalf. He, they saw the way that he loved them and cherished them and protected them and was good to them while at the same time advancing his kingdom around the world. It's a beautiful picture when you get to see the whole thing. But the reason that I say praise while the pressure is on is that trust is an investment that you're going to make when you're in the narrow way. And sometimes, like I said, there's not words to pray that make any sense. There's just moans. But there is something really important about you not just putting music on and listening to it, but you actually vocalizing praise to God in the form of trust that I don't see how this works out. I don't understand what you're doing. I cannot see the other side of this birth canal. I don't get it. Like I, I don't have a rational explanation for it. But I am not backing away from you, and I'm going to praise you in the middle of it and I'm probably going to need somebody else's music to do it and so I'm just going to put it on and I'm going to vocalize it I'm just going to say 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 it because deep down I've made a commitment and a decision that you are good and I'm following you no matter if I'm on the other side of that canal or I'm on the inside of that canal when the pressure gets put on and I'm going into that narrow way I am going to commit to vocalizing prayers to you vocalizing praise to you and vocalizing my heart to you but I will do it out of my mouth not just as a circle of thoughts in my head if you don't have a pattern if you don't have a pattern 
of going into difficult times and vocalizing your praise out of your mouth to God, you will seldom make it through that narrow way without imploding. And I think many of you have seen that in your life and you know it's true. And you know it's true. So only worshiping God when you feel like it doesn't help you that much. There's some worship we do to God that is not about us being helped. There is some worship to God that is about us being helped. God is okay with that exchange. He established it. But the reality is, is that narrow way demands that praise come out of your mouth, not because God needs to hear you praise him, but because it's an investment of trust in the middle of the difficulty when it looks like that investment might not pay off. And you know what we call that in the Bible? Faith. We call it faith. And faith is the commodity of the New Testament. Everything in the Bible, I'm sorry, everything in the New Testament happens because of faith. Salvation, blind people seeing, lame people walking, discharges of blood for 30 years, it's all healed because of faith. When Jesus walks into a town where there's no faith, what happens? Very, very little. It's the commodity of the New Testament. And the way that we engage it many times is we praise vocally, verbally, when it doesn't look like we can make it out of the other side. And the bottom line of it, that I want to just make clear, because the points are all fine and good. The narrow way is hard. (laughs) It's hard. We have to acknowledge our own wrongs. We have to face hard realities. We have to confront people about their wrongs. We have to really love our spouses. We have to open up about our vulnerabilities. We have to stop rationalizing. But we have to be able to have the ability We have to have the ability is that when you feel that sort of stuff going on in your life, that you can sense and know that there is a way through it, even though you can't figure it out and begin to engage your Father in heaven. Hey, I I, I want the narrow way here. I'm, I'm willing to do it like I'm willing. You'll have to consign yourself to do it. And once he does begin to kind of communicate the narrow way, if he hadn't already done so, which like I said, oftentimes he's already kind of put it there, It will take you consigning to it. At some point in that birth process, while that womb is going crazy, this is science again. That baby puts that eye down that canal and says, cool, let's go. Let's do it. That's true, right? (laughs) But you feel what I'm saying. There's going to be these brief moments inside of all of these pressure point times that you're in where you get an inkling of what that way is. You'll have to consign yourself. And once you consign yourself, what you will sense is the, the vigor and the strength of the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that Saul walked with when he's challenging the people that are killing Christians is the same Holy Spirit that's in you. And when you can consign yourself to, yeah, I'll do that. Sweet. Maybe painful. Got it. What you're going to find manifest in your life is going to be stronger relationships, stronger resource management. Your finances will grow. I'm not saying you get rich, but you learn to manage things better because you learn to find the right way of doing things even when it's difficult. Become better at your job. Life. And it's not little stuff. It's the transformative parts of us where we go from being boys to men and girls to women. So it's very meaningful. We go into the image of Christ. We able, we able to handle conflict like he handled conflict. Face difficulty like he faced difficulty. So if you'll stand up, I do want to worship. I think there's an opportunity for us here to invest some trust in our Father. (laughs) 
So if you would, you can close your eyes, you can put your hands out, you can put your hands in your pocket, you can sit on your hands, you can. But what I want you to do is conceive of where your heart is. And so Father, we do want the life that you have for us. We want you to be a reality. We want you to be a reality in our lives. We want to see your power and your goodness And Holy Spirit, we want to feel and understand and experience the comfort that you provide. We want those things for sure. And so we are saying as a body that we are willing to walk that way. We are willing to walk that narrow way. And so Holy Spirit, I'm asking right now in the name of Jesus that you would give revelation in the hearts and minds of the people in this room of a narrow way. If they are in the middle of a pressure point time and a difficult time, would you give them, once again, would you reveal to them, if you've revealed it 10 times already, Father, I'm asking you would reveal it again, the way they need to walk this out, the next step. And Father, we at this moment however costly it is on our end, we say that we trust you and that you're worth following. And it's not just that you're worth following, but it's worth it to walk in your way. You're not just worth following, but it is worth it to do it your way. Your way is worth it, however costly. And we say that to you now, theoretically. And God, if you will show us what it looks like to live it out practically in the in the specifics of our lives, we're yielded to you now to receive that in Jesus' name.